Amen. Well, uh, it's always an honor and a privilege to be here in Faith Forward Baptist Church, Tucson, to preach to the brethren. And uh, this is, again, a special day. It's Thanksgiving, where we have given thanks to our Lord, who's provided us with so much abundance of food and uh, uh, means and, and uh, a safe land. And especially I want to thank uh, Brother Martinez and his family and the brethren there for their hospitality today. And it's uh, just amazing that in, in, in spite of our bellies full, we are here to hear the Word of God and to sing songs of praises unto Him. So we, we thank God for all that He has given to us and uh, salvation through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, which is eternal life for the believer and the Bible and the church, which is off believers. So uh, Brother Gabriel, he just read Matthew chapter 14. It's a fascinating chapter, one of my favorites. And... Uh, this story towards the end of, of the disciples being in the boat and the storm which is caused by Jesus to uh, make the disciples understand trials and tribulations and for us to also see that there are trials and tribulations in our life and how Jesus calms the storm down. But in all this that is happening, you know, this uh, story is also uh, commented, upon, commented upon in the book of John as well and uh, in Luke as well. And, uh, but in Matthew chapter 14, please look at verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? So the title of my sermon is, What to do with doubt? What to do with doubt? And in this scenario, the disciples have been with uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for some time now. They just, a few verses ago, saw this fantastic miracle. Jesus fed 5,000, about 5,000 men, in addition to women and children. So there were probably 10,000 people there. And He just fed them. And that's just out of a few loaves of bread and a few small fishes. That's it. They have already seen this miracle, amongst others before. And yet in the storm, they're doubting Jesus. Now Jesus is walking on, on the sea, and he calls out Peter, and Peter is walking on water. What more does he need with regards to not doubting Jesus anymore? But yet the winds were boisterous, and he yet doubted. And then he started to sink, and Jesus saved him, and that's what Jesus says here. O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And we are today, we don't have Jesus in His uh, glorious body, flesh amongst us. But thank God for the believer, we have the Holy Spirit within us. But yet we doubt. We doubt at all aspects, with all aspects. In all situations, we are full of doubt. That's our human nature. Now what is doubt? Dictionary.com defines doubt as to be uncertain about, consider questionable or unlikely, hesitate to believe, to distrust, regard with suspicion. So this word doubt has many meanings to it and almost all of them seem negative. There's minimal positivity to these explanations, to these meanings uh, which the word doubt has. It's overwhelmingly a negative trait. Yet it is not always a bad thing. And we'll talk more about that, but overwhelmingly it is negative and the Bible has a lot of instances and examples of men and women doubting. And most of the times it's negative. It's, uh, it brings people shame sometimes and ridicule as well. And amongst men and women, people may say, women doubt more. And we'll see an example of a woman doubting. You don't need to go there. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 16, this is where Elisha is the prophet. And there's that famous woman from Shunem, the Shunammite woman. Her husband is very old. And her husband and this Shunammite woman, they host uh, Elisha. They nourish him, feed him, give him refuge. And Elisha wants to thank them. And he wants to bless the woman who has no child with a child. And he blesses her with the child. The Bible reads, And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. So he blesses her. And this he's doing in the name of God, because he's a man of God. Look at her, uh, uh, hear her reply. And she said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. 
a man of God, a prophet of God, whom you are helping, whom you're giving shelter to, whom you're listening to, he is blessing you with a very important blessing that you'll be with a child. But no, she doesn't thank him. She doesn't say, praise God. The first thing that comes out of her mouth is, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. handmaid. So what is this woman doing here? She's doubting the man of God. That's the inherent nature of women. Just doubt. Are men far behind? No. The Bible is full of men doubting as well. And go with me please to John chapter 20. How can this preaching on doubt amongst men be incomplete without doubting Thomas? We have all heard about him. And the scenario, the scenario of the story is that Jesus has already resurrected. He has met with uh, the apostles. And uh, 11 of them were present, but Thomas was missing. Now we'll read what the Bible says in John chapter 20, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. So again, he's just doubting. It's not that he's, he's, he just met Jesus the first time. No. He's been with Jesus, with the other disciples for three and a half years, seen all kinds of miracles happen. But yet he doubts the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 26, And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be, upon, peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. So again, Thomas is doubting God, and God himself had to come and prove to him that, Hey, don't doubt me. Don't doubt me. But what is Thomas, and what did this woman from Shunem do? Is it unnatural for them to doubt, to have doubted even God? God knows our weakness, for we are in the flesh. Our spirit may be willing, but our flesh is weak. So this is just these two examples, and there are many more. When God blessed Abraham and Sarah, that, hey, you will have children, you'll have a child, but they doubted as well. Gideon, when he was appointed by God to go and fight against the Midianites, Gideon was looking for signs to, to get his doubt uh, fixed by God himself using the fleece. So men and women have doubted God, and we are no different. We also doubt. We can doubt God even. For the Bible has examples of godly men that doubted God. John the Baptist being in prison. He's the one who baptized the Son of God, and yet in, in the travails of prison, he doubted God himself. And what causes doubt? Go with me to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. We'll start with Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, though. What causes doubt? Can we ignore the devil? The master doubt instiller, the doubt injector, the doubt infector. He did that in Eden, and he does that to this day. And so shall he do till he's cast into the lake of fire by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea. Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Eve and Adam are walking on a straight line. They have no confusion about God. They have no doubt about His commandment to not eat of uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But this doubt caster shows up and casts that doubt into Eve's mind. Verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So Eve is doing very well up to this point. She's answering back de the devil. I, I commend Eve for this. So the devil is trying to inject doubt, but she talks back to him. But she doesn't last. 
Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So, who proved stronger here? The devil, the doubt caster. Eve tried to come back at him, but she failed. And because she was not strong, she was laid snare into this doubt that the, the snare of doubt that the devil cast for her. And that led to her sinning, and that led to Adam sinning, and we all in this state because of them. Doubt and stillers are around us. Not just the devil. The devil is not the only doubt instiller. Human beings, because now, because of Adam's sin, we are, we are you know, sinners, and we doubt as well, and we have people around us who cast doubt into our hearts, into our minds, pertaining to anything and everything. And there, there were these doubt instillers with prophets as well. Again, going to Elisha, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 16. You don't need to go there. So Elisha has been ordained as the successor of Elijah already. And Elijah has been taken up in this fiery chariot of God. He has been translated into the kingdom of heaven. And Elisha is left with the mantle of Elijah, and the sons of the prophets are there. And they said unto him, they say unto Eli Elisha, Behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. Lest peradventure the Spirit of the Lord hath taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. Eli Elisha saw with his own eyes Elijah being translated into heaven in the chariot. He saw it. And these doubters, these doubt casters are around him. The sons of prophets, they're telling him, no. Probably he's been cast, thrown away into some mountain. Let us go and search him out. And he said, ye shall not send. Again, Elisha resp uh, responds appropriately. Don't, don't send, don't send. He has this, confident, this confidence. Verse 17, And when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. They sent therefore fifty men, and they sought three days, but found him not. So, this doubt was cast into Elisha, and he executed that doubt. He told his, his, uh, the, pro the sons of the prophets, go look for him, look for him. And they did not find him. Why not? Because Elisha has been taken up. And this leads to some shame for, for, for Elisha. And when they came again unto him, for he tarried at Jer Jericho, he said unto them, Did I not say unto you, go not? Yeah, you did, but you still allowed them because you fell into a doubt. You should not have, you should have stuck with your... With your, uh, with your confidence of what you saw, of Elijah being taken up in the chariots. So this is another example of people around us. We have seen things, we believe things, we have our convictions about God, about the Bible, about salvation, but people all around us will try to cast doubts. And yesterday, this is what happened, I was so winning uh, in Phoenix, and I met this atheistic man. He was gentle, polite, and then he was getting into a debate and I was not inclined to go into this debate. And then he started casting doubt on my own faith. He said, are you sure that you believe in hell? I said, yes, I'm sure. Are you sure that God exists? And again and again, he would just keep going around in the circle of reasoning. And I preached to him some verses and then I left. Because there's no point of wasting time with such people. Casting doubt. Doubt is inherent to humanity. It's, it is inherent. It is part and parcel of our being. So when in doubt, what to do? What should we do when we have doubt every day in one thing or the other? Regardless of, regardless of the cause of doubt, be it the devil or be it other human beings around us, regardless of the cause, an important aspect of countering doubt is giving it time and patience. Please go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. Now, we can have doubts in different situations of our lives. We have 
relationships with fellow human beings at different levels for different durations of times. We get our vehicle repaired. Our relationship with the technician there is probably just for a few hours, maybe for a few days. On the other extreme, there's the relationship of a husband with his wife over decades. And doubts can creep up. Doubts can creep up if a young man is courting a young woman and vice versa to get married. Doubts can cre creep up in the place of employment between employer and employee. Doubts can creep up in the church setting amongst laymen or between leadership of the church and laity. So in these situations and others, we must often just be patient. We must not be hasty to just enforce our doubt and just reject anybody for any reason. We must give place to doubts we may have. 1 Timothy verse five, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 24. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Just give it some time. Yeah, we, we're doubting somebody because they may come and bite us. They may come and harm us. We don't know that. We observe some things about them and our suspicions, uh, you know, our, our, our alerts went up and we have doubt. But don't act upon it immediately. Just give it time. Because if they are sinful men for any reason, if they're sinful, saved or unsaved, that will manifest itself in due time. And if they're decent, good, they're not harmful, that will also come forth. And we must be observant as well about our surroundings, especially the people that we interact with in the, in the world. And we should watch their deeds. We should watch their actions. When we have doubt, when we have somebody on our radar, be patient. Don't be, don't be hasty. Watch them. Look at their deeds. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 3, verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. So Jesus is talking about deeds, works of people, which help us discern what kind of people they are. He's making a clear distinction, dis distinction here between the unsaved and the saved, calling the unsaved evil. And in today's world, yes, we have a lot of unsafe people, which, which may be evil. They may be good also. But regardless, we look at their deeds, their actions, to give support or credence to our own doubts. We must not jump to make conclusions about anybody based on our doubts. And amongst brethren, yes, actions are important. The world says actions speak louder than words. But amongst believers, actions are equal to words. So we must not just pay attention to actions of people when, when in doubt about somebody, but also pay attention, open our ears, and hear what comes out of their mouth. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, you don't need to go there. Jesus says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of his evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So it is very important, you know, we have doubt. What to do with doubt? We doubt somebody in any of our uh, uh, hundreds of relationships in our life. We have doubt. What to do? Be patient. Don't be hasty. Look at their deeds and listen to what they're saying because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What kind of things are they saying? In this example that I gave, a young man dating a young girl to get married later on, and out of the young man's mouth, all, all, all that's coming out is money, greed for money, the stock market, football, the game. He rattles out all the names of the players, but does not know all the books and sequence of the Bible. That's a, a, a strong hint to the young woman if she's wise enough to discern. And vice versa. What if the young woman is just talking about fashion and makeup and a desire, oh, I wish of, uh, I, I want to marry a man who's a millionaire. I want to drive a Rolls Royce and this and that. So that just shows what's coming out of their mouth. 
and amongst church brethren. Yes, we have a strong consolation that majority of our brethren within this room are saved. Would to God all be saved, but yet we are not perfect. And what comes out of our mouth sometimes? Nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. But in the purview of doubt, you see, we can have suspicions amongst each other. They crop up sometimes. But not to just jump on our suspicion, on our doubt about anybody, just without reason. No. Give it time. Watch their deeds. Listen to what they're saying. What else can we do when, when we're in doubt? Please go with me to Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. And I will read to you from Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So when in doubt, take counsel. Counsel means advice. Discuss. And the Bible is full of examples of kings and others that were in problems and challenges. They had doubts and they did, they did not just sit on their doubt. They took counsel. And in Daniel chapter 2, this is Nebuchadnezzar who had this strange dream which is perplexing him. And he's full of doubt as to what this dream is about. And what does he do? Verse 1. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep brake from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, and the astrologers, and the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. So this is a good thing that Nebuchadnezzar did. We know he's king, he has power, he has people around him. So he has them at our disposal, but we also have people. I should not say at our disposal, but in our social circle, whom we should talk to, discuss, and take counsel from, when in doubt. We should not hesitate from that. But what kind of people should we take counsel from? People themselves that are wise. People whom we can look up to. Them should we seek counsel from. Proverbs 20, verse 5, the Bible reads, Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. So we have family members, friends, brethren in the church from which we can take counsel, but getting counsel itself requires wisdom, and we should be. We should have that wisdom. We should be that wise to get that counsel. And when we get that counsel, think upon it and act upon it. So take counsel. What to do with doubt? Don't be hasty. Be patient. Give it time. And take counsel. And what else can we do when in doubt? Most importantly, go to prayer to God. 1 Samuel, please. 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1. And I will read to you from Matthew chapter 21, 21 verse 22. And all, Jesus says here, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. This is the power of prayer. And when in doubt, when in confusion, when in uncertainty, you know, we must pray to God, and we must pr pray to God believing, and we will receive. This is the promise of God. And this situation, this instance in 1 Samuel, is where David is, in, is, is brought into a state of doubt, and he reaches to God in prayer. And this is when Samuel is on the run. He's fleeing Saul. He's, he's gathered himself about 600 men. And they're on the run. They're going through a lot of trial and tribulation. So please, 1 Samuel 23, verse 1. The Bible says, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they've robbed the threshing floors. So David is told that, hey, this... Uh, city is being attacked by the Philistines, which are the enemies of David, and also of Saul. Verse 2, Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? I love this, that David is a brave man. He's very powerful. He's very strong. He's the armor bearer of Saul. He has already killed Goliath. He's a strong man. He's good with a sword. He's good with weapon systems. And he has, you know, 600 men. I'm sure they're strong as well, and they can do a lot of harm to the enemy. But David just doesn't jump. Oh, let's go. He's very humble. 
and he reaches to God and he prays to God. And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. So God tells him, Go. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? So David is ready. He's the commander of these men. He's telling them, Let's go. But what do the soldiers do? What, is his, what do his men do? They cast doubt in his heart. Should we go? We're already... You know, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? God has told David, go. He's ready to go. David is ready to go with his men. But the men, no, they cast doubt into David's heart. Look at verse 4. Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. I love this. Doubt, full of doubt. And David inquires again at, at, you know, of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought, oh, brought, brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. So such should we be as well. We should never hesitate in this uh, best and most effective strategy when we are in doubt to seek God in our prayer for wisdom, direction, to give judgment in our situation help. We should never hesitate from that. Such a brave man, David, he is also leaning on God. And God delivers him. Now, can doubt be good? You know, doubt is overwhelmingly a negative trait. You know, it slows us down. It can uh, break fellowship. It can cause harm. You know, bring suspicions. And one example in the Bible of this continuous doubter who never did any of these things at all is Saul who doubted David again and again. He, he, he did not take these measures. He was not slow. He was not patient. He was not hasty. He did not seek counsel. And he did not reach out to God. In fact, the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. And we know his end, how he died with suicide, with his, with his sons, the, his kingdom destroyed and lost to the Philistines. But can doubt be good? Yes, it can be good. Please go with me to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Doubt can certainly be good, and one kind of doubt which can be good is self-doubt. <laughs> you see, this word self-confidence is not found in the Bible. We should not lean unto our own understandings. And when we want to take significant, important steps in our life, we should have some self-doubt. Because... That is a protective mechanism that God has given to us. And as children of God, as men and women of God, we should have some self-doubt. We should not be brash. We should not be overconfident, especially youngsters. We should not be brash. So in this situation, self-doubt self is a positive trait. And here in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible says, then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, this is Jeremiah's, uh, Jeremiah's words, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now the words of God in verse 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Verse 6, Then said I, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Again, I love this. God is entrusting Jeremiah with an extremely important responsibility to be a preacher of the Word of God. And Jeremiah says, I am a child. He has some self-doubt in him. He's not completely full of confidence. Yes, Lord, I'll go. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, no. Another man like this was Moses. He was also very meek, and God is telling him again and again, go do this, speak for me to Pharaoh. He's coming up with a lot of excuses because he had some doubt in himself. God had to give him re repeated reassurances. And that's what God does to Jeremiah here again. God gives him that reassurance. Verse 7, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. 
See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. So I don't know, maybe God was checking Jeremiah out as well. Does he have any quotient of humility in him? Is he too confident? And here Jeremiah proves himself. No, he has some self-doubt. He's not confident in his abilities. Such should we be as well. Self-doubt is a protective mechanism. And sometimes God wants to see us doubt ourselves so that we can lean on God and His power so that He could take us through our situations of doubt and other situations as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. You don't need to go there. The Bible reads, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Prove means to prove, to try and to test. And how can we try and test if we don't doubt? Some degree of doubt is required. Matthew 24, verse 4, Jesus says, Take heed that no man deceive you. If we blindly trust everything and anything around us, we, have, we stand a high chance of being deceived. So what do we do to not be deceived all the time? We should be suspect. We should have some doubt. We should not be welcoming to every idea that we come across. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 15, the Bible reads, The simple believeth every word. But the prudent man looketh well to his going. We must be prudent. prudent com prudence comes with wisdom, caution, a bit of doubt, not being brash, not being overly confident. Just, yes, all things, are, you, you know, I can just do anything without any thought, any wisdom. I can just do it. No. We must be prudent. We must, be, we must not be hasty. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God especially pertaining to spiritual matters. We have a bombardment of ideas pertaining to the Bible coming from all corners of the world on YouTube and elsewhere. We must try those spirits, whether they be of God or not. We must have that doubt always, that suspicion in these things. Now, we are saved people. We have the Holy Ghost within our hearts, and the Holy Ghost will help us. But do we allow the Holy Ghost to help us? We should. Another kind of good doubt is of potential Judas Iscariots. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, please. Now, this is not for us to just go hunting like a witch hunt, just uh, blindly trusting anybody who just comes into the church. No. I believe that, that there are three destinations of an unsaved person who comes into our churches. One is that he will get saved. Two is that he will leave unsaved, hearing the hard preaching of God from the mouth of the preachers. He will leave. The third, if he's not saved and still has not left, very soon he will show his true colors. And then he'll be thrown out. But we must not ignore the fourth possibility which exists as well, which is that exactly of Judas Iscariot who was with Jesus. Now only Jesus knew him. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who believed him, believed him not. But he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Jesus knew him, but none of the others. He was so slick, so smooth, nobody could even suspect him. And such Judases are there amongst our midst also. If he was with Jesus, who are we? Now we have come across people that were, yes, we, we were able to identify them. And we have witnessed ourselves in our churches that they were thrown out. Now, they, they, some, some people had suspicions. They had doubts about those people. And they, they did according to patience and counsel. You know, they did not exercise their, their doubts with haste. And these Judases revealed themselves as well. So we should have doubt on people that are repetitively just being insolent. We should mark such people and give it time. For Paul writes here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Their follies shall be manifest unto all. That time will come that they will be manifest. 
So again, coming to that aspect of being patient for these potential Judases that are amongst us. And also these doubt instillers again. The devil was the doubt instiller into Eve in heaven, but we have people who are doubt instillers as well. Some of them may be saved, but a, a hallmark of these potential Judases is that they will you know, instill doubt in our mind about Jesus, about the faith, about our churches, about our leaderships, our pastors, our deacons. So we must be wary of, these, of such elements. And in Titus chapter 3, verse 9, because what do these people do? They've, how do they cast doubt? By asking foolish questions, vain jangling about simple aspects which are clarified completely in the Bible. No, they will not understand. And they will come back again and again, asking those same questions in circular reasoning. Paul writes in Titus chapter 3, verse 9, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. So if we have people in our church who are doing these things, just continuously asking foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and bringing contentions and are striving about the law, they're unprofitable. These things are vain. Yes, we should doubt them. But could a believer also display such signs? That's possible. So we must be patient. We must be patient. But if, that is, if it is established by multiple brethren, but hey, a lot of other brethren have similar doubts as we have taken counsel. Then Paul writes in Romans chapter 16, verse 17, Brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. So these are instances where doubt is positive. It's protective. It helps us survive. In, in, in conclusion, you know, doubt is an integral part of our personalities. It will go away on, in the day of our resurrection. But till then, we should be patient. When in doubt, we should not ha be hasty. We should not jump to conclusions. We should not just jump to attack anybody without any reason. We should take counsel, discuss, with brethren. We should watch, keep our eyes open, our ears open. We should be attentive. And we should pray and seek God for wisdom and direction. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Easier, very easy to read, very wonderful words, but difficult to do. Because our self-confidence, our pride, that, that's what comes in the way. So, and the good part of doubt, yeah, doubt, but hey, don't become paranoid with, with our doubt. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. So we'll end in prayer.